So we have to be super careful, but, and especially men. Again, men have suicide rates that are five to ten times higher yeah. than women. And that, that's, a, that's really not a good sign. Mm -hmm. um, because when it's that big a difference, it shows that one gender, one sex, is having enormous problems finding meaning in life. And that's a super problem. Yeah. Um, because there is this background, dukkha, the suffering. And there are only two ways out of that. One is you find meaning in your life. And people like Jordan Peterson would say, well, and you find meaning through assuming responsibility. And that's fine. That's one indication. But what, how you actually find meaning is, is through contacting in all four quadrants. Yeah. So you get meaning not just from your, your own agency and you're all by yourself and you're Superman and it's just you because you're also part of a larger whole lot, whether you like it or not. And so you, you have not just agency, you have communion. And the more communion you have with people, the better you feel about life. The studies on this are crystal clear. The studies also show that starting in the, in the 60s, that kind of communion started to break. And a Harvard professor wrote a fairly famous book, um, Bowling Alone, because that's what started to happen, is communions just started to dissolve and you're left with just your own broken agency, your yeah. own isolated, set-apart agency. It's hard to find meaning under those circumstances. It's hard to find purpose. It's hard to be successful because you're not even sure which way to go. Yeah. And that, those are reasons that men do have five to ten times the suicide rate of women. And it's an indicator of how society actually is treating men. Yep. And it's treating men much worse than it's treating women. 100%. We're disposable. Yeah. Well, men are ways. disposable sex. Mm. They were always the ones that had to die. The 95% of, of deaths at work are men deaths. We don't see feminists screaming that more lumberjacks should be women. That's we right. don't see women screaming that more roofers should be women. Right. We don't see feminists screaming that more plumbers should be women. Those jobs are all 95% men. Mm -hmm. And women aren't being oppressed from those jobs. They just don't want to do them. That's where they're saying, they're, that, that, that's where they say, not that there should be more women, but women should be able to work those jobs if a woman chooses to work those. Hey, that's healthy feminism right there. That's right. And that's, the fact is a woman can't. There's nothing stopped. The woman has equal up. She didn't get in any of yep. those jobs. She doesn't want to. Yep. And fine. And integral feminism says that's part of what we have to do is recognize differences, including different interests, different types of multiple intelligence that are favored by one sex over the other, and allow those to manifest. That's, again, inadvertently what's happened in, in the Scandinavian countries where they're trying to make them equal by erasing any sort of um, cultural necessary roles. And what happens when you do that is you just leave nothing but the biological differences. Right. And those become greater. Those really manifest. And that's why in all the egalitarian cultures, the differences, the measurable differences between men and women are, are the highest in any countries in the world. Fascinating. And that's what we're getting. That's fine. It's just we have to be aware of that. And what we don't want to do in that process is take the healthy version of masculine or feminine, call it toxic and pathological, and then have the highest orthodox conventional uh, uh, institutions claim that it's toxic and that we had to start taking young boys and make them not be competent, mm -hmm. stoic, exploratory, aggressive, and, and by aggression, it is only a force that helps break down boundaries. Right. It's not 
hate. Hate is different. Aggression, the only definition of aggression is to move toward. Mm. Hate is to move against. That's not inherent in aggression in males. Male aggression is simply competence and a desire to go out and achieve and be successful. That seems to be an inherent part of the biological component in the upper right of male. And so, yes, we're going to take those into account. And if women don't want to be roofers, if they don't want to be engineers, we're not going to force it. Right. We're going to make sure that there's absolutely equal opportunity and that women um, are um, included in what you might call advertising for the field. So anybody, women attracted to it, they can do it now. Mm -hmm. Get it into any of those. So there's not a single thing preventing them from doing it. The only thing that's preventing them from doing it is they don't want to. <laughs> they just don't like it that much. And that's fine. Get with the picture, feminists. <laughs> Completely fucking this thing up. It's a nightmare. So a lot of men shoot themselves at a staggering rate. And that's the other side of the gun homicide thing. It's, again, it, two-thirds at least of gun homicides are suicides. Mm -hmm. And those are the ones that just aren't talked about. That's right. But this is what's causing those. And almost all those suicides are men. And it's, this is a case of how society is treating men. And it started with like the Vietnam War when they're over there fighting for the country and they come back and are attacked and shamed and humiliated for what they did. Now, how can you do that? How, I mean, that's an absolute disposable sex. They, all they're good for just going out killing and then you can throw them off the cliff because yeah. they're just toxic, pathetic individuals. No wonder they're killing themselves at that rate. And gun homicide has to look at suicide as the principal major problem of gun violence. And it's, it's society's attack on masculinity that has a large part to play in that. And so that's one of the things we want to work with. And that does mean society has to stop calling masculine values toxic. Amen. In their healthy forms, some feminists are completely clear about this. Okay. I mean, um, Camille uh, Paglia, she's famous for saying, if evolution was left up to women, we'd still all be living in grass huts. <laughs> and it, it, that may or may not be technically accurate, but it's in the ballpark. Um, so we, we've got to stop doing that. There, there are books, as I said, are called things like The War on Boys, uh, Warren Farrell has done a book called The Boy Crisis, and mm -hmm. I've done a dialogue with him here, and we can look at that. It's a serious problem. It's starting when kids are two and three and four years old. They're being talked out of their biological inheritances, and you can't do that. Right. So I, what you can do is help men integrate all of those factors and that can start at age two or three. And you can start to show young boys how to play in an aggressive way, but not let aggression turn into hate. There's moving towards, yep. and there's moving against. And you, wanna, you can learn how to select those and use them and integrate them. Mm. And that's what we want to be doing. We don't want to be spending time looking at every single thing a boy does and then criticizing and say, that's your toxic masculinity. That's pathetic. Shame on you. Right. He says, well, how do I get out of being a boy? And then says, you can't, you little prick. You're stuck with it, and we're going to fix your ass. And what we have right now is a whole series of roadblocks to men, to the educational system. And we have a whole series of greased and oiled pathways for women to easily go forward. And they are, and men aren't. And the men that are left behind become real problems. Yeah. But this does have to do with fatherless.
families and the, and the extraordinary difficulty that that tends to bring up. Um, and strangely, one of the, um, so many things about the fatherless situation are really counterintuitive. And one of the most counterintuitive has to do with empathy. Because what studies have found is that regularly, and in almost all cases, when young children are raised by just a father, as opposed to just a mother, the ones who are raised by just a father, and this includes both boys and girls, they have greater degrees of empathy, trust, and capacity to make friends. And the mom, single moms, have low in comparison. And it's kind of odd because as a general rule, women are more empathic. And, um, but, they, and, but they also um, are much more permissive. Mm. And so you'll find um, studies, for example, where you have very young looking, in some cases, actually underage, 16 year old, uh, kids working for a researcher and what the kids are supposed to do is stand outside a liquor store and ask incoming people, you, you know, they'll say, you know, here, just buy me a little bit of beer and they'll give them money, something like that. And so in, in sort of study after study, what they found, oh, I'll just give examples of one. In one case, there, there were 16 men, 16 women. And all 16 men said no. And all the women, except one, said yes. And so they volunteered to do it. None of the men would volunteer to do it. Now, even though men tend to have less empathy, again, the counterintuitive part, one of the reasons it works is that for a young child, if they express um, like a frustration or a concern or a desire to mom, mom will step in and immediately, you know, oh, we can do this and we can do that. And oh, they're soothing and it's not a problem. No, you don't have to do that anymore and so on. And so the mother's just sort of fully understanding the young child's situation. The young child goes to the father and expresses it. The father's not as empathic. He doesn't have this automatic understanding that mom has. And ironically, that forces the kid to actually try to figure out what the hell dad's thinking. Right. So he has to actually take the role of other and, and work his way through that and work her way through that. And so both boys and girls have more empathy when they're raised by fathers as opposed to, as opposed to moms. And again, one of, and this is, again, this is, I don't even like talking about the topic um, because I was raised um, just, again, that classic orange liberal. Mm -hmm. um, so I was totally in favor when sort of Murphy Brown was going to have a single child. I was all in favor of it, even though the vice president at the time sort of poo-pooed it and looked down on it because he was Republican. Um, and uh, it was one of the biggest shocks of my life when I started looking, seeing the data. It's just overwhelming um, of how really severely, badly, um, single, well, fatherless children do. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, um, even um, Obama um, said that fatherless African Americans mm -hmm. um, had a um, a five time um, were five times more likely to be poor nine times more likely to drop out of high school and 20 times more likely to be in jail. That's right. Now those are just horrifying numbers. And I have some more that I, uh, 
give you a bit later as it relates to gun violence. Mm -hmm. um, this is a serious, serious issue. And we certainly, this is where it does point to how we need an all quadrant approach to problems. Yeah. And this is where it's the most irritating because Republicans focus on lower left and Democrats focus on lower right, and it's just as fragmented as abortion and gun rights views. And it's just horrifying. Mm. Um, it does go to point out that, and particularly because, well, if you look at 19, it's common to say, and there is much truth to this, that because of the years of slavery, that there are still horrible repercussions from that in the black community. And that's absolutely true. Mm -hmm. But not all problems can be blamed on that. That's right. So what we see, for example, is that the percentage of families that were fatherless in 1940, it was about 14%. In 1960, it was up between, uh, up around 35% or so. And then after 50 years of civil rights movement, the percentage of fatherless homes in the black community now is pushing a staggering 75%. No, it's nuts. I mean, and if you see just even Obama's quote about, okay, that 75% of the blacks that are being produced now are going to have those kinds of um, things working against them, including 20 times more likely to be imprisoned, nine times more likely um, to drop out, five times more likely to be poor. That just comes with that bit of the territory. Mm. And notice how much that went up the farther away you got from slavery. Right. So you can't blame all of that on slavery. That's not going to work. Um, so these are issues, and these are really, really serious issues. Yeah. And then when it comes down to something like 7% of the population are black males, and close to 60% of gun-related homicide are by black males. 60%. Mm -hmm. That's shocking. And it's horrifying. And the cure isn't just get rid of all the guns. That's right. Because there are intrinsic problems with that. Part of the cure, and every black intellectual in the world Thomas Sowell, Shelby Steele, Coleman Hughes, Larry Elder, um, Williams. I mean, on and on and on. Every single one of them agrees that, well, um, the, one of the uh, major heads of the NAACP was asked flat out, what's the largest problem facing blacks today? Is it racism or fatherlessness? Without hesitating, he said, fatherlessness. That's right. Of course. When you're cranking out 75% of your kids guaranteed to hit these kinds of roadblocks, what the hell do you expect? Yep. And it's particularly sad because those inner city urban areas do tend, in most cases, to be run by liberals. Mm -hmm. um, and or I would say progressives, not liberals. Liberals would actually do something about it. Um, green progressives don't, and that's the problem. Um, so, so those are real um, issues. And right now, um, I, we just sort of got off uh, um, to that because we were talking about empathy mm -hmm. and how fatherlessness can tie into a problem with empathy as well. by just focusing on the negative aspects of what 
um, is being tracked. So like I say, if you're, if you're looking at um, groups that are ahead of other groups or groups that seem to be doing better, and all you're tracking is power and oppression, you're not tracking love and generosity and compassion and care and concern and charity and all of that, then it really does generate this um, uh, uh, a system of values where the preeminent value becomes victimhood. And this is really, this is really, really a problem because what we have, particularly if you look at sociologists, we actually have a much finer understanding of this if we look at developmental psychology because it looks at individuals very carefully. Whereas developmental sociology just looks at very broad um, sweeps of people and sort of gets their average um, values or ideas. It's been well known in social circles that from the Middle Ages into modernity and the Western Enlightenment, um, the notion of what would make a successful person changed and it changed subtly but in significant ways. So at Amber, a person was successful and they were looked up to and they had status and it was called an honor society. So if you had honors, you did something honorable or noble, then you were looked up to. It's in the same way that in the 1950s, 1960s, you would have an honor society in school and kids that scored very high on tests and otherwise excelled, then they would receive honor. And, and, and um, this depended on your group, you know, appreciating you and recognizing what you had done. And so it was indeed a sort of a group orientation mm -hmm. with the emergence of modernity a different um, success ethic came up. And this one was called dignity. So here you could feel good about yourself. You, had, you were successful if you simply had self dignity. And this wasn't dependent so much on other people honoring you. It was your capacity to generate self-esteem, mm. your own self-esteem, whether other people liked you or not. And so we can see that fits very well with what developmental psychology tells us about moving from conformist into individualistic stages of development. And those are two very broad value systems that pretty much every sociologist recognized. In the last 10 years, sociologists, and particularly with studies on college campuses, have found a third value ethic emerge. And so now, in addition to honor and dignity, the third one is victimhood. Mm. Literally, that's what's been discovered. So that's a horrible thing to do because what it means is there's one group that's doing all the nasty oppression and that's white, cisgendered, heteronormative, male, European males. That's the source of all of the world's evil, all of it. And so they are the great oppressors. Everybody else is victims. And so what you're actually teaching all of these minorities is that they might as well not even try to succeed in this culture because you're just going to be held down. You're a, a victim of massive um, oppression. Now, never mind that, for example, 75% of black adolescents, this is adolescents who appear where they can be highly sensitive, only 75%, uh, well, 75 of them say they have never been the victim of oppression, ever. So somebody's not matching up. You have the social justice warriors saying they're all victims of oppression all the time and you can't get out of it. And you have the mass majority of saying, no, I'm not. But if you say that too loudly, you'll be disowned. Mm -hmm. And if you have the wrong political view in that, 
you'll be extremely disowned. So let me give an example of where we have to pay attention to equal outcome, even though we already have equal opportunity. Mm -hmm. And that is in 1970, about 69% of college degrees went to males and about 31% to females. Now, there was already equal opportunity in place. This is after the Civil Rights Act, after the Voting Act, um, the women's movement was in full force. There was no law anywhere in the United States that said you can't get into college if you're female. As a matter of fact, that was illegal. And if you did that, you could be fined or even in some cases sent to prison. So that wasn't the reason that there wasn't uh, an equal outcome. But as uh, <clears throat> the United States on the whole looked at the results here and they saw that, wait a minute, there's this enormous not equal outcome. And so even though there's equal opportunity and as many women can get in as, as, as possible, something bad is still happening. So the United States decided they didn't like that. And over the next um, three or four decades, in line with just the general civil rights atmosphere, started to implement social actions that would help get more women through that pipeline. Mm -hmm. And there were really some enormously strong measures that were taken. Um, women at almost every level of education had um, um, counselors and advice and recommendations about why they should do this and why they should move forward and why this was important. And they were just supported all the way through the educational system and males weren't. And, and as a matter of fact, they were, if anything, kind of held down a little bit. So what happened by 2015 is that around 70% of college degrees were now going to women and 30% to men. And many, of course, would say, well, we sort of overshot right? And maybe that's a little bit over correction. And, and if that's, if that's what it was, that would be fine. But what it also was, was just this new, as we've seen with ways that green became broken green, is it would try to cure one bias by inserting another bias. Mm -hmm. And cure one prejudice by creating another prejudice. And so by this point, there was a real prejudice against male. And already males were being identified as inherently possessing toxic masculinity. And this was an immutable characteristic. So like almost all the other characteristics that the social justice activists blamed for the problem, these are all immutable. I mean, if you're black or you're a woman or you're a white man, these are all problematic issues, but none of those characteristics can be changed. So there's no cure for the problem the way you're diagnosing it. Nothing can be done about any of that. And so that's a real major, um, major issue. Mm. Um, so what would start to happen is we started to look at, okay, well, exactly what, uh, this equal outcome thing, when does that stop? And one of the real problems is that what wasn't being taken into account is any sort of possible interior characteristics or qualities or just interests that people had that would guide them to do different types of activities. And if they weren't doing some activities, it may be due to oppression, it may be due to just their own lack of qualifications in that area. Or it may be that they're perfectly qualified in that area, but they're just not interested in it. They're just not that, not that hot. Um, so you find, for example, 
and what started to happen is this whole oppression Olympics, which is that given that white heteronormative cisgendered European males are the cause of all problems, they're at the top of the hierarchy. They are the ones that have all the power. And these are all dominator hierarchies, of course. So there's um, white males at the top and then all the other groups spread out under them in a dominator hierarchy. And what started to happen, particularly as we get into intersectionality and intersectionalism, is that feminists started to get the idea that because all of these other groups were oppressed by this one power monopolizing, oppressing group, that they all had to come together and share their oppressions because all of their oppressions would overlap and they would all overlap in mutually reinforcing ways. Hmm. So what we would get is um, the idea was that because they would all overlap in mutually reinforcing ways that it would all be something like a um, black, female, lesbian, disabled. And those are all oppressed groups. And so putting those all together, this would put them very high in the oppression Olympics. Now, again, no positive qualities are counted. There's no love or charity or care or concern. What's being added up in this intersectionalism is nothing but broken green items. That's the only thing that's being counted. That's all that goes into the intersectional mix. And so once they actually started looking at it, then you started to get real problems, like just take, let's say, a black male. And because he's a male, then inherently he has toxic masculinity. And he can't get away from that. And then compare that to a white female, because she has white supremacy. So which is going to win in the oppression Olympics, the uh, black male or the white female? All right, but it, it just got worse and worse and worse. You have a fight of a fat white female versus a skinny Hispanic male. Now, which one of those gets higher in the victimhood race? And all you're getting credit for are these things that are broken and new. That's it. Yep. There's no, oh, let's take um, a black man, a white female, let's take a black male who's incredibly loving, caring, has an enormous amount of generosity and charity versus the white female who's nasty and cruel and does enormous amounts of damage. None of these things are being balanced. It's just all the classic, nasty broken green items that are just added together mm. and then one of the real problems is just as we can say okay there's a black male and a white female there's male versus female but there's black versus white so which one is worse and how do we actually put these together and one of the real problems is because all of the power of oppression all of the tyrannical, nasty, hierarchical power are put in the white, able-bodied, cisgendered, heteronormative European males. Then none of the other groups are capable of, of oppression. So it said, if you're black, you can't be a racist. If you're a woman, you can't be a sexist. So none of the capacities, clearly, if you have a black man and a white woman, the whiteness of the white woman is going to have some sort of oppressing tendencies on the blackness of the black man. And the masculinity of the black man is going to have some sort of oppressing tendencies on the femaleness of the white female. So you've got both of them are oppressors and both of them are oppressed. That's not what intersectionality will tell you. Ever. It won't even mention that. 
because none of what Jonathan Haidt calls the seven sacred victimhood groups, LGBTQ, female, black, disabled, Hispanic, etc. None of them have a capacity for oppression or wield power or can do any sort of damage. And so you're getting a desperately skewed situation here. And as intersectionalism tried to keep sort of adding up all the things that are going wrong, all they got was this smorgasbord that in almost every way disagreed with the fundamental tenets of social justice. Mm. And so that was just a bit of, uh, of, of a nightmare. And then you started to have things like, well, where do we actually apply social justice? So, for example, 95% of on-the-job deaths occur to men. You don't hear feminists saying, we want that to be 50-50. 95% um, of men are roofers, and 95% of them are lumberjacks and 95% of plumbers are men. But you don't hear feminists protesting because 50% of plumbers aren't women or 50% of roofers aren't women. How about homelessness? 85% of homeless people are men. You don't hear feminists wanting 50% of that. So it's a real problem. If you look at something like, just across the board of intersectionality, if you look Two at batteries. something like, um, National Basketball Association, 70% black, 1% Jewish. Now, if we're going to have real equality of outcome and 14% of the population are black, then 14% of MBA should be black, not 70%. And if 5% of the population is Jewish, then 5% of the MBA should be Jewish. They're not. But you don't hear that as protested by any sort of social justice. So it's very, very selective in terms of the groups that they consider the most sacred victims. Now, it, to return to a healthy, integral social justice, what we're looking at, if we have this race, and everybody who's qualified gets to run it because of equal opportunity from orange. And then we wait and see, well, are there any groups that consistently finish behind other groups? If that happens, then we're not getting equal outcome. So we don't have equality. So social justice is upset and it wants to see what's happened. Well, in order to actually be able to, in a healthy way, include equal outcome, you have to allow that there are other factors, including some that are a product of free choice of an individual that will have them not finish along with everybody else. <clears throat> so you have to actually include interior factors for why there can be differences in how different groups do differently in different areas.